Hey sup, welcome back to our channel and have a nice day. So in this video we are gonna see, what if Naruto had sacred gear and devil has slaves, this is part 7, and if you want more then please leave a like share and subscribe. Let's get in the video. Naruto stared nonplussed at the sight before him the next afternoon, following the notification of Riser's desire to contest the contracts. It was also the afternoon following Naruto's formal reply, sent via Grafia, that should he allow the contest to occur, he would be setting stipulations, and thus the afternoon after his acquiring of both Tsunami and Akeno as his women. Ria's was already his. He had no reason to allow the contest to happen, outside of putting Riser in his place. So he gave his own terms. Should Riser win, Naruto would hand over Ria's. However, should Naruto win, the Phoenix and Gremory families each had options to choose from for their forfeiture. The Phoenix family would have to choose between giving Naruto and his peerage a one-year daily supply of their valuable Phoenix tears, or giving Riser's peerage to Naruto to do with as he pleased. It was not an impossible trade-off. Naruto was legally Rhea's husband already, by underworld law, and Riser didn't honestly have a leg to stand on. The tears and Riser's peerage each held an equivalent value to the Phoenix house, as Rhea's did to the Uzumaki. The Gremory, though. Naruto was beyond pissed at Lord Gremory for allowing the contract to so much as be questioned, let alone contested, when Naruto had already stated clearly that Ria's was his. Thus the Gremory had to choose between giving him a chance to impregnate Grafia who was legally registered as a servant of Gremory despite being married to Serzich's, and allow him to claim the child as an Uzumaki, or give up the rights to recruit in the elemental nations that they had received from the Uzumaki for Ria's hand in the first place, or they could outright give Grafia to him. Naruto didn't hold out any hope on that third option. Understandably, both families would balk at the choices. Neither would want to give something up, despite the realization that contesting his contract was an insult to the Uzumaki on the part of the Phoenix, and an even bigger insult on the part of Gremory. They really didn't have a choice. Even if they backed out immediately, Naruto could still call for the options to be reinstated as punishments and force them through. It was a literal no-win situation. However none of this was here or there at the moment. Sitting on the desk in front of him was a red, scale-like object with a large green gem in the middle. Quite frankly it resembled the base form of a twice-critical, much like A.M. possessed. Beyond that, on the other side of the desk, stood Haidu Issei. Somehow Riaz had managed to not only remove the sacred gear from the boy, but also reincarnated him for the hell of it. Something about how she felt bad that his parents lost a child. Honestly, Naruto wasn't really paying attention, he was more trying to comprehend having to deal with a teenage copy of Jiraiya. The thought was not pleasant. So now Ria's had a new pawn, who cost only a single piece, and she had presented Naruto with a sacred gear, a Longinus class like she had said. The Longinus in question was called Boosted Gear, it held the soul and power of one of the two heavenly dragons, the Red Dragon Emperor, Drake. And she decided to give it to him because he had told her of the raiding game he was to have against Riser. Speaking of Ria's, she had assumed a position just to his right, beside the very chair she insisted to use, while Makoto took her typical place at his left. The redeed had, however, decided to wear something other than her typical school uniform, and Naruto was finding it difficult not taking her right there. Short-sleeved white button-up shirt, tied just under her bust to leave her belly and a good portion of her bust exposed, dark purple bra showing through the opening of her shirt, along with the Uzumaki crest, short denim skirt that barely covered her ass and pussy from view, and white thigh-high stockings. Yummy. Sighing, Naruto turned his head to Tsukiko, who was sitting in repose on one of the couches in the club room beside Hinata and Haku, and gestured to the gear. She had a major affinity for all things draconic, her familiar proving that idea without doubt. Might as well give her the damned Red Dragon Emperor, too. Naruto returned his attention to Ria's as Tsukiko placed the item on her left hand, good thing for her that she was left-handed. I don't suppose you'd be willing to give him to Jiraiya. You know, congregate the perverts. Ria smirked, says the man with a harem. Naruto nodded, yes, and like any other man with a harem I do not wish to share. Allowing that perverted sack of flesh to leer at you or another woman of mine is not something I wish. I can respect that, Naruto-senpai. For it is my dream to be a harem king. Issei declared loudly, holding his right hand up in a fist. Naruto just gave the other boy a blank stare. Issei really was just like Jiraiya. Maybe putting the two of them together would be a bad idea. Screw it. He'd figure it out later with Ria's. Issei was her pawn after all, she had the right to decide what to do with him. Shaking his head, Naruto pulled Ria's into his lap and nuzzled at her neck, delighting in the shudder he felt run through her. All right, I suppose introductions are in order. Ria's chan as he is part of your peerage, I believe the first ones he should know are yours. The girl in his arms managed to pull her mind from its own personal gutter right, Naruto dan apostrophe na dot. Issei blinked and quickly raised his hand like he was in class, uh, Ria's senpai, why did you call Naruto senpai dana? Because I am her husband, by underworld law, or you could simply call it what it is. 
devil tradition. Naruto replied for the obviously distracted girl, I took her virginity, she bears my mark above her heart, therefore she is mine. The perverted boy let out a cry of anguish as he fell to his knees, Nuo. Now I'll never get to taste those api. I highly doubt you had any real chance of that anyways, pervert. Tsukiko said from her position on the couch. This caused said pervert to drop his head in depression, falling into a crouch with his knees to his chest, a cloud above his head, using one finger to draw circles in the carpet. Naruto rubbed the bridge of his nose. If he stays like that, we'll never get out of here, he muttered. Ashina raised her hand, um, I don't want to interrupt, Naruto-kun, but my water just broke. I'm going into early labor. Silence reigned for all of 10 seconds before Tsunade was bustling Kashina out of the room, toward a small hospital-like room equipped to deal with every situation the busty medic could think of. Which was quite a few, actually, so it wasn't really a small room. Naruto followed swiftly, taking the precautions that he had done when he was present for the births of his other children, and grimaced slightly, knowing he'd be going through it again soon enough with Kuroka. Shaking that thought from his mind, he took up a position at Kashina's left, holding her hand in support. This birth was indeed early, by a month at least. Naruto could only hope there weren't any problems. Rekisei watched as Naruto, the red-haired and obviously pregnant woman, and the busty blonde he knew as the school's new nurse, Tsunade sensei rushed out of the room. There was a certain level of detachment from the situation, being an outsider until all of a few minutes ago. The whole thing was somewhat surreal. Suo, Naruto-senpai's going to be a father? Issei asked, trying to get a grip on things. Rias glanced at him as she assumed a seat in the recently vacated chair. Naruto Dana is already a father. Now he's going to be one again. If not for certain niceties involved, I'd be bearing his children myself as well. Fortunately or unfortunately depending on who you ask, Naruto Dana doesn't hold with teenage pregnancy. He believes that giving birth before the body is matured can cause negative effects for the mother. Oh. Really? What more could he say? It was Naruto's belief, even if there was that saying of if there's grass on the field, play ball which was a fairly detestable saying, honestly. Some girls developed pubic hair really early in life, and their bodies were nowhere near ready for the burden of childbirth. Issei shook his head, um, I think Naruto-senpai said something about introductions. Rias nodded, correct. Every person in this room is a devil, including you, Issei. Though we are divided between two separate peerages. You are part of mine. I am Rias Gremory Uzumaki, former heiress to the Gremory House of the Underworld. For certain reasons that I don't feel like divulging, the Uzumaki portion of my name is in contention at this point in time. I am also the president of the Occult Research Club. Though that's really more of a hobby and screen to hide our activities from the humans. Feel free to call me Butchu. Himijima Akano. I am Butchu's queen. Udo Kiba. Ria's Butchu's knight. Doju Kaneko. Rook. Issei rubbed the back of his neck and when no one else was standing up he said, Aha, nice to meet you. Hi to Issei, just call me Issei. He stopped, blinked, then turned his attention to others that hadn't said anything. Um, but you, if those three and myself are your peerage, then does that mean? Anada hid a smile behind her hand, it seems the pervert isn't as dumb as he looks. Yes, the Ristafas belong to Naruto-sama. Issei's eyes bulged. So many of the others were beautiful women, and they all belonged to Naruto's peerage. Lucky bastard. The members of Naruto's group couldn't stop a snort of mirth at that comment. Really, it was just too funny. Finally shaking her head in mirth, Hinata stood up to begin the introductions for her side. Uzumaki Hayuga Hinata, Naruto-sama's princess. An irregular piece. The blonde woman that left is Uzumaki Senjutsunade, his queen, and Uzumaki Kashina, his Amazon. Seeing confusion on the boy's face, she sighed, don't worry about the peace aspect of our introductions. You'll become intimately familiar with the concept later. Issei just nodded. He had no clue what those titles were about. Did it mean that Hinata-senpai was a princess? If so, then Akeno-senpai and Tsunade-sensei were queens. Ugh, thinking about it made his head hurt. Yuhi Kurinai, bishop. Naruto-sama has another bishop, but she has duties elsewhere at the moment. Said one of the new teachers. Issei would admit that he dreamed of being able to fondle the woman's breasts. Izuki Yugao, knight, and my fiancé, Jeko Haid, also a knight. A wave accompanied the purple-haired woman's words. Uzumaki Nai Yujito. Naruto-sama's first rook. Tsubaku no Gara. Rook. The dead stare Gara sent Issei unnerved the poor boy. Gara was one of Kuo's two great gentlemen and supposedly in a relationship with a pretty pink-haired girl. He was so far outside Issei's kind of social circle that there might as well have been a mountain between them. Ichiha Makoto. Irregular peace, Empress. A kind smile from the motherly type woman and Issei felt much more at ease. That ease fled with the next introduction. Lamachi's abusa, irregular, dragon. Pointed teeth glinted evilly in the fading light of day, reminding Issei of a great predator seeing prey. He hoped he wasn't the prey, he doubted he'd get very far. Uzumaki Mabui. 
irregular piece, was her. The silver-haired woman didn't seem inclined to say anything more, and Issei was happy to leave it be. Her stare was almost as unnerving as Gara's. Uzumaki Samui. Pong. Nothing more, and Issei wasn't about to press when he could simply ogle the giant tits of the new art teacher weight, she put Uzumaki in her name shit. Another one taken by that blonde bastard. Uzumaki Ichihatsukiko, pawn to my beloved Naruto-sama. The stars in her eyes made Issei jealous of Naruto. That kind of devotion is hard to come by damn it. Uzumaki and Yuzuka Hana. Pawn to my beloved Alpha-sama, came the dreamy voice from the slightly feral woman. Alpha-sama. Is that a kink, or something else? Ichiraku am. Pawn. Soon to be of the Ichiha if I have anything to say about it, she muttered the last bit, but it was easily caught. Issei, knowing nothing, left it alone. Uzumaki Yuki Haku. Pawn. Grope me, or ogle me, and I'll put your eyes out. As she was twirling a couple of large, sharp needles while saying this, Issei took her word for it and moved his eyes. That's everyone here, Ria said with a small smile. Naruto Danda has more pieces than I do, but there are reasons for that. Reasons you don't need to know, Issei. For now, we'll see if we can't bring you up to speed somehow. But that said, Ria's pulled out a box filled with paper. She smiled, your first task as a devil is to hand out these summoning flyers. We'll get to the next step when you're done. You woo. The first step on my road to becoming harem king. A fire shone in Issei's eyes as he grabbed the box and dashed from the room, all previous thoughts having fled from his mind. Ifufu. When you said we might be getting an idiotic little brother soon, I thought you might be joking, but you. Akeno said with one hand covering her lips. Sadly, Akeno-san, Mabui said quietly, perversion and stupidity often go hand in hand. Ria's just sighed and pulled a piece of paper from a small stack on the desk. Naruto wasn't the only one to use that desk for their paperwork, she just insisted that he use it too. Partly because they could actually share the seat while doing work, and partly so she could sift through his work and find just what her new clan was up to. She noticed a few minutes later that both Hinata and Haku had left the room. Probably to help with the birthing. Both of them are aspiring medics after all. Now, let's see what the Yuzumaki are up to. Break the next day, Naruto was sitting on one of the couches in the club room, his head in his hands as Issei and Ria's argued about something. The boy had apparently met the acquaintance of a young nun and made friends. It was taboo, but right now Naruto couldn't care less. The births of his four newest children had not gone well, and Kashina was now in a medically induced coma. For the second time in her life. Due to the early nature of her labor and the fact that there were four children being born, Tsunade decided against letting the births happen normally and performed what she called a C-section. Why it was called that, Naruto didn't know or care, all he knew was that his Yuzumaki life partner was once again on death's door and there was nothing he could do to help her. Though the children were perfectly fine. Something Naruto was about ready to thank God for. But you, you don't understand. Asia Chan's my friend. And I'm sure her healing sacred gear could be of use to us. Issei shouted, his words penetrating Naruto's cloud of despair. Healing. Naruto said, his head rising from his hands, fire in his eyes as a cautious hope filled him. Issei, you had better be certain of your words. Did you say healing sacred gear? Issei stumbled back a step in surprise at the intense emotions flooding across Naruto's face, before firming and nodding resolutely. Yes, Naruto-senpai. Two green glowing rings, one on either hand. I saw her heal a little boy's scraped knee in moments. Naruto nodded, head down in thought, muttering to himself, green glow, two rings, almost instant healing of a minor scrape. His head shot up, twilight healing. Ria's frowned, she didn't want to get Naruto's hopes up, but if it was true. Then they could save Kashina. Naruto Dana. Are you thinking what I think you are? Naruto nodded once and turned his attention back to Issei. Can you tell me or lead me to the church they're holed up in? It was Issei's turn to nod, yes. I remember the place perfectly. Naruto's grin turned predatory, then we have a nun to save. Tsunade, please take care of Kashina while the rest of us retrieve the girl. Tsunade bowed, of course, Naruto-kun. I am a doctor, and she is my patient, and furthermore she is my fellow bride. I will keep her alive and as comfortable as possible. Naruto Dana. This is reckless. You don't know if those fallen are here on orders. You could restart the war. Ria's protested. She loved Kashina like her own mother and as a sister wife, but was the woman really worth restarting a centuries-old conflict? I would do that same for any of you, you know that Ria's. Peace, even this ceasefire, without my family is nothing but ash in my mouth. Naruto said strongly, his eyes firm with conviction. The sigh escaped her lips, followed by a smirk forming. Well, I suppose I should have seen that coming from my stubborn husband. All right. Ria slammed her hands on the desk as she rose suddenly, as your wife, it is my duty to support you. I and my peerage will hold the barrier in place for you. We'll let none escape. Though, she paused and cast a sidelong glance at her new pawn, I'll be sending a say with you. 
Might as well let him see how a real devil fights, after all he's only had that pathetic display with Visor yesterday. Naruto rubbed his chin and thought, I guess I could take him with me, but without his gear, he's practically worthless in a fight. A small silence fell over the gathered devils. It was true, without the boosted gear, Issei's combat potential dropped right back to that of an ordinary human. Albeit, a human with a slightly stronger body and wings, but his combat potential wasn't in existence to begin with. For Issei, who wished to be a hero for this nun, this Asia, it was the hardest of blows. The brunette's depression was almost at rock bottom when Mabui broke the silence, Naruto-sama, I believe we have a possible solution within the vault. Naruto could easily hear the capital V and raised an eyebrow. The items in the vault weren't all powerful or destructive items, some of them were simply useless to most of the clan. There were weapons, armor, odd trinkets, and various other items locked away, and while most fit the dangerous or destructive categories, some were just out of no current use. Granted, some of those also fell in the previous categories, but if they weren't of immediate use, they often became forgotten over time. Mabui nodded in response to Naruto's unasked question, item 784 has been restless for some time now. I believe that this might be a good time to allow it to be of use. Naruto other eyebrow shot up to join its brother in his hair. Item 784. If he remembered correctly that was a semi-sentient sort of demon origin, with some slight telepathic capabilities and an energy conversion ability. It was generally considered an evil sword, if only because it required its possessor to win a battle for psychic domination, and its base aura was one of darkness. It was not the sort of weapon Naruto would expect Mabui to recommend for a newly reincarnated devil to test his teeth on. I'll do it. Issei exclaimed, his hand raised in front of his face in a fist. I'll use this item, Naruto-senpai. I want to save Asia. Naruto stared at the other boy in a mixture of admiration and incredulity. Issei didn't even know anything about the sword, and he was already declaring that he would use it. Are you stupid? The blunt question tore itself from Naruto's mouth and stunned the entire room. Uh, what? Naruto pinched the bridge of his nose, Issei, the item in question is a sort of demon origin, which means it was made from a demon. It has what could be described as a mind of its own. If you cannot suppress or subjugate the will of the sword, it will control you until you are no more. Uh. Just what does that mean? Issei asked nervously. It means that it will continue to use your body to help it kill and kill and kill until your body crumbles to dust. However, long before that point we will be forced to stop you. Permanently. Naruto replied bluntly. Apparently it was his night for blunt statements. Just as well, Naruto doubted he could really handle subtle at the moment. Issei shuddered and seemed on the verge of withdrawing himself from the equation, but suddenly straightened his back, a fire once more in his eyes. I'll do it. Please let me do it. Naruto took a few more moments to stare into Issei's determined eyes, gauging him. Finally, after what seemed like eternity to Issei, Naruto broke eye contact and grunted, if you end up a homicidal maniac, don't say I didn't warn you, right? Sighing, Naruto gestured to Mabui, I assume that you have already retrieved the weapon. Of course. Then put it down, point first as is proper. Of course. I am from Kumo, Naruto-sama. As in Kiri, Kenjutsu has been taught in our academy from the founding. So saying, she placed her hand on the floor, a simple circle appearing in front of her. From the circle rose a sword, a double-edged tsurugi with a simple rectangular guard, cord-bound grip, and what seemed to be a brass coin-like pommel. Issei, meet Takajin. Naruto said quietly. Good luck. Break Naruto faced an old and supposedly abandoned church that Issei had led them to. The young man in question stood just to Naruto's left, Tsurugi in his right hand. Naruto had to silently admit to being impressed with Issei's willpower in overcoming the blade's natural inclination toward wanton slaughter. That fact truly was impressive, considering the sword was bathed in the blood of innocence during its creation. One could say that its only purpose was wanton slaughter. To force it to abandon that purpose, force it to follow your own designs, was nothing to scoff at. Issei gained quite a few points with all the members of the peerages for his unbreakable will in the face of such evil. The only spoiling point about Issei's subduing of the sword was the cry of Apai. At the end. Naruto had allowed the young man, pervert or not, he wasn't really a boy anymore, time to recover before leading them to the lair of the fallen. An old church that hadn't been in actual use for decades. Which was kinda obvious in hindsight. Alright, one last time, Issei. This is your rescue, your shot, take us through it. Naruto said quietly, his eyes giving silent encouragement. Right, Issei responded just as quietly. They were almost inside the enemy's territory, being quiet seemed like a good idea. Ria's Buchu, Akeno Senpai, and Zabuza Sensei will contain and deal with whatever enemies stand guard at the back door. Meanwhile you, Kaneko-chan, Kiba-san, Kurenai-sensei, Tsukiko-senpai, and me will enter through the front, destroy everyone and everything standing in our way, and rescue Asia. Everyone else was left behind to protect the clubhouse in Kishina-san, though not in that order. 
the named parties nodded, and the two groups split up to their assigned tasks. The night would run red with the blood of the fallen. And there was nothing that would stop it, short of God himself arriving. Not bloody likely. A few minutes, which felt like hours to the two anxious young men, passed in silence broken only by the breathing of the gathered group. Then Issei burst into motion, leading the charge into the building. Naruto led him, he wanted the enemy to focus on the demon sword, it would make it far easier for him and his to destroy them. Naruto watched with a detached amusement as a stray exorcist confronted Issei's charge, only to be blown into small pieces by a boosted gear-enhanced punch from Tsukiko. Seriously, this world underestimated everyone. He and his peerage were shinobi, with the exception of A.M., and even she had some training to keep up. There was no way a normal human, even one with a light sword and light bullet gun, could hope to match up. He did stop momentarily, however, to seal away the exorcist's weapons. He might not be able to use them, but Hinata probably could. And if not, then he could always take them apart to learn how they were made and craft versions for his people. Issei apparently didn't even notice the exorcist's demise as he kept on charging toward an open hole in the floor in front of the altar. Naruto followed swiftly, Dwarnwin in hand, he had a nun to save, so she could save his Kashina. At the base of the stairs, Issei was already hewing through fallen priests and exorcists with Takajin, the sword probably working to suppress the natural reaction humans had toward their first kill. This was not the time to fall apart and vomit. Naruto started in on the slaughter, his vision narrowed to one thing. The female fallen angel at the far end of the room. If he took her down, the ritual that was in progress would cease immediately. His sword was a little more than a blur as he raced for the fallen, his mind set, his purpose unwavering. He would save Kashina, he would not allow her to be taken from him again. And to do that, he a devil had to save the nun. Somewhere in the back of his mind, the irony of the situation waited to be recognized. The fallen angel noticed his approach quickly. Fairly easy when the screams of the dying distracted one from one's work. She turned with an irritated expression on her face, only for it to be replaced with fear and horror. She recognized him from reports she had read about the other world, a devil who wielded an ancient fairy sword, Yuzumaki Naruto. And he was cutting swaths through her minions with the efficiency and brutality of a wildfire, the yellow flames cascading over the humans enhancing the image. Rainer, as was the fallen's name, was many things. Proud, arrogant, deceitful, ambitious, lustful, murderous, etc. She did her level best, though, to keep stupid from ever appearing on that list. Her mind whirred for a moment and settled on the first course of action that presented a clear possibility of survival. She cancelled the ritual, dropped to her knees, pressed her face into the ground, and shouted, I surrender. Under the ceasefire accords, I surrender myself to Lord Yuzumaki Naruto. May he do with me as he will, in exchange for my life. All action ceased on the instant. The fallen priests and exorcists still alive had expressions ranging from shock and confusion to outright betrayal. Whereas Naruto and Issei both sported dumbfounded looks. What? The? Fuck. Serzicha stared blankly at the missive laying on his desk from the desk of his brother-in-law. Honestly he was feeling like he had been hit over the head with a pole axe, he was that stunned. He looked up into the impassive face of Yuzumaki Mabui, Naruto's self-appointed secretary. The woman didn't look the least bit worried at the prospect of facing Amayu's wrath, instead she held herself adroitly, neither submissive nor assertive, ready to both sit down to tear to flee. Serzicha's admitted silently to himself that it was an impressive standing posture. One that few could possibly pull off. Fewer still would have the, what did they call them these days? Ah yes, the Kahans to stand up to one of the four Mao. He ruefully recognized Naruto's insane luck in getting this woman, both as a wife and as a peerage member. I have to wonder, Mabui-san, if your husband understands that the tone of this message could easily be construed as treasonous in the wrong light. Mabui didn't so much as blink, didn't twitch, and didn't bother answering in the slightest. Of course Naruto was aware of that, he had told her everything before sending her off. Serzich's would be a fool to think otherwise, and despite whatever else she might think of him, Mabui doubted that a man who obtained his position of power was a fool. Serzich's studied her for a few minutes, seeing if she would crack. When she didn't, his rueful feeling was finally expressed upon his face. Of course he knows, who am I trying to kid? Don't answer that, he replied quickly, it's obvious I'm trying to fool myself, and it's not working any better than my stare did on you. Mabui inclined her head slightly. One of the things that made her give this man some modicum of respect was that he didn't bother lying to himself any more than he felt he had to. He was a politician on top of a warrior, though, so he was bound to have told himself some lies to help him sleep better. Serzichas turned his attention to something in the courtyard outside his office window. I wonder just how much young Naruto-kun knows, he mused quietly to himself. It wasn't quite quiet enough, though. I'd imagine he knows far more than he's truly comfortable with, Mabui said, never changing her posture. The red-haired man turned back to her with a bemused expression, yes, I'd imagine so as well. He admitted softly. 
there were few he would trust with such secrets as those young Naruto managed to figure out just by logic. Your answer, please, Lucifer-sama. Serzich straightened himself out, his thoughts becoming organized again. Yes, well obviously since these demands are against multiple parties, I'll have to go over the stipulations with them as well. I understand that Yuzumaki Dono has recently been through a traumatic experience, please give him my heartfelt congratulations on both his children's birth and Kishina sense survival. I will meet with the parties involved within the next three days and have their replies. I guarantee it will be well within the remaining time frame allowed before the match. Babui bowed, as you wish. I will relay your answer. Farewell this day, Lucifer Sama. But that she disappeared into a transportation circle, leaving one nonplus Serzich's behind. His bitter expression said everything as he looked back out the window, farewell. Unlikely, but I cannot fault her courtesy. Her outside in the courtyard was Grafia, playing with his young son, Milikas. If his father and mother know, if Lord and Lady Gremory decided such, Milikas would be losing the only figure he knew of as a mother, for Grafia was still legally listed as servant to the Gremory house. Not for the first time, Serzichas found himself cursing the Lady of Bad Luck. It seemed that Bishaba had it out for him the same way Tamora loved Naruto. Break Naruto reclined in bed, his arms wrapped gently around the now much slimmer waist of Kashina. He actually felt like thanking the biblical god that Asia's soul-bound sacred gear was indeed the legendary twilight healing, which allowed her to heal anyone or anything, regardless of race. It was the reason he was able to spend time just laying around with Kashina rather than watching her waste away in a coma. He had felt enough gratitude toward Asia, however, that he had allowed her what was possibly the first choice she was presented with in her life. Stay and become a member of one of the peerages, or she was free to leave and find her own way. The blonde nun was incredibly shy, though, and found the idea of having no foundation to fall back on to be more than terrifying. As such, Asia chose to become a peerage member. To be more specific, she wanted to stay with Issei Sanso Rias took her in as a bishop, increasing the young girl's magical reserves which weren't very large to begin with and was having Issei shelter her within his parents' home. That didn't require much, a quick deal with the current student council president, Sauna Shatori, or as her family knew her, Sona Citri who was also a devil, along with a small application of magic, and the Haidu parents believed Asia was a foreign exchange student, chosen to live with them for her time in Kuo. Now, Naruto just wanted to waste a day holding Kashina in bed. He knew he couldn't or rather shouldn't, but he was at least going to enjoy what time he could with her. Their four newborn daughters were all doing just fine, sleeping peacefully in cribs nearby, but he figured naming them was going to be annoying as he didn't hold with the matching names idea. They were each their own person, not parts of one. M.M., Naruto-kun, Kashina muttered sleepily as she stirred. He placed a quick kiss on the back of her neck, I'm here, just keep on sleeping Kashina-chan. The longer you do, the longer I can stay away from the paperwork. She giggled a little, that's not fair, Naruto-kun, I had to deal with paperwork even when pregnant with you. Yes, he agreed quietly, nibbling lightly on her earlobe, but you aren't in charge of it anymore, I am. And I say that I want to spend more time enjoying this moment. The girls are going to be awake soon and wanting breakfast, Kashina replied, her eyes sparkling far too much for Naruto's liking. And, as if summoned by her very words, one of the four babies woke and started to make a fuss right at that moment. Naruto sighed and released his hold on Kashina, letting her tend to the needs of their daughter. As she held the child to her bosom to allow her to breastfeed, he had to tamp down a surge of desire. Now was not the time to bend her over and have fun. He got out of bed and headed for the adjoining bathroom, well you take care of them, I'll get ready to face the day. I asked Mabui to deliver my ultimatum to Serzich's last night, and I have no doubt she was her usual prompt self. MMHM, whatever you say, Anada. She replied dreamily, watching her daughter feed with a tender expression. Do try to play nice, though, okay. He rolled his eyes, yes dear. Break Naruto blinked. Looked again. Blinked again. Then decided the appropriate thing to do was. Slam his head against the desk and hope something new presented itself after. So he did. Looking back up, he noted that nothing had changed and sighed heavily. Fire would have worked, temporarily at least. But it wouldn't have lasted and it would only be worse the next day. The waiting paperwork had actually reached the ceiling. It's only been one day, Naruto said in disbelief. Most of those are notices from various other devil families that are going to be watching and evaluating your upcoming match against Riser san Yeoi said. She wasn't Mabui, but she was competent enough that Naruto rarely noticed. The forms for this month's finances have already been forwarded to Kakuzu-san, she hesitated a moment before continuing, I also think you should be aware that Hyden-san has disappeared. Naruto waved one hand in the air, using a quick burst of magic to reach for the topmost sheaf of papers. He's probably just out killing someone or converting them. Just keep an eye on the news for a large number of unrelated deaths, that'll probably be him. Is it really alright to just leave him alone like that? 
she asked, frowning slightly. Most likely not, Naruto agreed absently, but he answers to Kashina, not me. Or, more accurately, he said, pausing from his perusal and meeting her worry gaze, it would be proper to say that she can yank him back any time she wants, whereas I cannot. So, as long as she doesn't see anything wrong with it, I'll just let him be. I see, was her uncertain reply. Beside, if you're truly worried, yayoi san bring it up with Kashina. I left matters involving Haydn in her hands because he's her rook. Yes, Naruto-sama, Yeoi said with a small bow, clearly unhappy. Alright, he gave in, never having been able to deny a woman. If you're that worried about it, have Kashina recall him and set him back to work. Maybe he can learn to kill chickens or something. Her face lit up in joy that a request wasn't being brushed off, yes sir. Naruto shook his head as he watched Yeoi practically skip and bounce out of the room. He knew there was a distinct problem with the way Haydn thought and worked, especially from a former human's perspective. It was, according to Yeoi and her friends from Testu no Kuni, more than a little disturbing how much enjoyment Haydn could extract from toying with his kills. Dot Yeoi had a nice ass though. Shaking his head, Naruto refocused on the sheaf in his hands. A message from the Citri family, huh? This should be interesting. Ray Craner sat in a closed room, her compatriots Middleton Kalawarner with her. Each had a single bracelet on their wrist, with some odd markings that somehow managed to lock away their supernatural powers, both of light and general magic. None of them had ever heard of such an item before, and it quite honestly made them even more frightened of the man who made them while they watched. After all, if he could whip up three of these items in the few minutes they witnessed, what else could their captor, Yuzumaki Naruto, head of the semi-legendary Yuzumaki clan, do with ease? Conceivably he could simply kill them, as had been their fourth member's fate, a male fallen by the name of Donaseek, who had died in the opening salvo at the crushing hand of a black-haired girl in possession of a salamander dagger. They knew, however, that the only thing keeping them alive was the bargain struck in the heat of the moment by Raynor. The bargain that said so long as he kept them alive, he could do with them as he desired. Naruto had stated that the deal made by the Fallen's de facto leader, in this case Raynor, was extended to all those under her command. Thus why Middleton Kalawarner were still alive with her. All three women had obviously been cared for and had just as obviously come to the conclusion that they would be used as little more than concubines to sate the Yuzumaki man's lust. Given the clan's aptitude and known appetite for sex, they felt it was a safe bet, no matter how well dressed they were or how well taken care of. Rainer was currently appareled in a simple black silk kimono, her dark lustrous black hair was pulled into a simple ponytail. Her violet eyes held the look of defeat but also strangely of anticipation. She was almost hoping to be used as she figured they all would be. Middled, a petite blonde girl with her hair and two long ringlets, was dressed in a revealing French maid outfit. Well, she called it a maid outfit, but it was so tight in the chest that her small breasts were actually visible, and the skirt was short enough that if she bent the slightest bit anyone watching would get a free upskirt view of her currently uncovered bottom. The tiny white apron in the front of the skirt didn't even come close to helping her feel better about it. Whereas Kalawarner, a mature-bodied woman with long blue hair, which was left free of restraint, was outfitted much as she would expect a secretary to be, only in a dark burgundy, dress skirt with a slit up both sides to show off her long legs, a formal jacket with only a single button to hold it together, and white button-up blouse that did nothing to hide her fairly impressive bust from the world. The three had talked things over repeatedly, and none of them could quite tell where their plans had gone awry, but they did agree that drawing the attention of one of the most infamous pillar families was what really did them in. Even if it was mostly extinct by this point, the Yuzumaki held a reputation for swift and brutal retaliation. They all looked up as the door opened, and in doorway was a woman they had become rather familiar with. Yuzumaki Senjutsunade. She had been their doctor, their fashion consultant who had chosen each of their outfits, and even arguably their best friend. They weren't fooled, though, they knew this woman was high up in Naruto's peerage, even if they didn't know exactly which piece she was. It was then that Raynor noticed the busty blonde was wearing a very revealing grey top, open enough to show the symbol of queen from the game of chess. She silently cursed herself. Of course the Yuzumaki would send his queen to keep tabs on them. As the highest ranked member of the peerage, the queen held a number of duties that Raynor, as a fallen angel, wasn't quite certain as to the extent of. She just knew there were many. Naruto-kun will see you girls now, Tsunade said, remember to be on your best behavior. We understand, Raynor replied. They stood and followed Tsunade out the door, down a hall, then down two flights of stairs, and down another hall to a set of double doors. Straightening their shoulders to capture as much dignity as they could, especially in Middle's case with that maid uniform doing nothing to hide her assets, they then pushed on through the doors. It was time to face the music and discover just how they would be used for the rest of their lives. Rainer blinked a little, surprised by the room in question. She had expected some kind of formal courthouse setting or something similar. 
instead she and her two compatriots were treated to a well-upholstered study office, with a young man she had surrendered to sitting behind a large desk on the far side of the room from the doors. The three fallen angels had to do a quick double take, however, when they noticed someone else in the room. The red-haired grimmery girl they expected, and even the few members of either peerage weren't a surprise, but a man sitting casually on one of the couches was. And he was someone they knew very well. Black slacks, red banded jacket, lightly tanned skin, sharp features, dark eyes, and black hair with the fringe bangs of bright golden blonde. Azazel, the leader of the Grigori organization of fallen angels. In other words, Rainer's boss. Azazel Sama. Middle squawked in surprise and embarrassment. Her outfit was really flattering to her thin figure, but the skirt was just so short. What would he think? Yo. The man replied nonchalantly, I understand you caused some trouble for Yuzumaki Kun here, then surrendered to him. Ah, yes sir. Rainer nearly stuttered. This was the man who held the fallen angels together during the Great War and led them through the after times. He had so much of her respect it wasn't even funny. Azazel sighed, and it was as he moved to put it down that Rainer realized he had been holding a cup of tea. Now why would you go and do that? Haven't I said it repeatedly? The best chance of continued existence for us fallen angels is to not make our enemies more pissed at us than normal. He frowned slightly, I'll admit that as fallen we automatically piss some off, though most of the angels would never admit to it themselves. Pretentious little. Azazel. Naruto said firmly, drawing the room's attention, I invited you here so you could be assured that I was keeping to my end of the bargain. These three will live as I choose to allow, you are merely a witness. However, he continued as his eyes cut to the pale features of Raynor, I would indeed like to hear your reasons for attempting something in my bride's territory. Raynor started sweating heavily, we were acting under orders to retrieve the sacred gear, twilight healing, from the disgraced holy maiden, Asia Argento. The orders in question didn't say what to do with the gear once we had it, so I figured I'd simply keep it. As Azul frowned, I gave no such order. I especially would not have chosen the Gremory territory to do such a thing. Rainer gulped, my pardon, sir, but the orders had your seal. I still have them in a personal little extra-dimensional space I could retrieve them from, if you and Yuzumaki-sama wish. At the nod of both men, she reached into empty air and pulled out a small rolled-up parchment. Handing it over over to Azazel, she stepped back to await the verdict. The Grigori leader's eyes turned to Flint, damn it. Unfortunately, this is indeed my seal, but I most certainly did not write these orders. Which means. Pair to explain for those of us in the room who are not of your ranks. Naruto interjected dryly. Ah, sorry about that, Azazel said sheepishly, I tend to get lost in my thoughts. Only two or three others in the Grigori can touch my seal, and of them only one is unhappy with the ceasefire. No, he corrected himself with a shake of his head, unhappy is not the correct word. Board would be a better choice. Naruto blinked at him, you're saying that one of your highest ranked people would instigate this kind of thing because they were bored. The man sighed, I can understand your incredulity, but each of us were originally angels and created by him with a purpose in mind. Mine, if you're curious, was affairs management. I was literally created to handle all the tedious little things that kept heaven running. Kakabiel, the bored person in question, was created to fight. Nothing else, just to fight. Where I fell due to a desire for freedom, he fell to his bloodlust. As much as it pains me to say it, Kakabiel is just enough of a bastard to start another war to alleviate his boredom. Actually, in point of fact, he has done just that a few times in the past. Do I even want to know? Probably not. Ah. Naruto shook his head, well, let's get on with this, shall we? Azazel nodded, resting his arms on the back of the couch and lounging languidly. He would admit to being somewhat worried for his subordinates, but after having talked with the young man, he felt he no real need. They wouldn't be killed out of hand for being fallen angels, and this Yuzumaki Naruto had even allowed him to have a brief look at the boosted gear. Nice kid, all in all. Right, Rainer, was it? A nod of the head was his response from the dark-haired woman, from what I saw of you, you have a fairly balanced style that relies heavily on your light spear. Thus I'm giving you over to Rias as a pawn for her peerage. You are to serve her faithfully, and in return you will be allowed the same rights as any other peerage member. Do you understand? The woman swallowed nervously, I understand, Yuzumaki-sama. I am to become one of Rias Gremory's pawns. Good, next, middled. The blonde lowly type looked at him in apprehension, you will become as you are outfitted, a maid of the Yuzumaki. However, as such you will also be added to one of the peerages. You are to be Makoto's first piece, I leave your position up to her to decide. Do you understand? Yes, Yuzumaki-sama. I am to become a piece for Makoto-sama. Middle gave a minimalistic bow. Damn short skirt. Lastly, Kalawarner. The blue-haired woman stood at attention, you will be joining my dear Mabui's peerage and learning how to keep in separate important documents out from the merely mundane. In short, you as well are to become as you have been dressed, a secretary. Do you understand? 
Alwiner seemed to sigh in relief, yes, Yuzumaki-sama. I will return your trust with faithful service. Good. Then we are done here. Riaz, Mabui, and Makoto take your new members and add them as you please. Ladies, I hope each of you learns quickly and that you get along properly with your new fellows. Let's face it, dissension in the workplace is beyond annoying. Azazel, I will have Tsunade show you out. Have a pleasant day. But that said, Naruto grabbed a sheaf of papers and, clearly ignoring everyone in the room, began to read. All three women bowed, yes, Yuzumaki-sama. Break Serzich's once again was across the desk from someone, or rather, several someones. To his left were Lord and Lady Phoenix, to his right were Lord and Lady Gremory, and a little behind them was Grafi Elusifuge. Despite being his wife, she had refused his original last name or his current one, and she declared that until certain criteria were met, that would not change. Does the boy really think he can demand these forfeits? Lord Phoenix asked incredulously. Serzich's didn't answer him, but Lady Gremory did. Unfortunately, the young house head is well within his rights to demand all of these, let alone simply allowing us to choose one. Lady Phoenix blinked and turned a shocked gaze on her counterpart. Surely you're joking, Venelana. These demands are outrageous. Perhaps they are, Lord Grimmery interrupted, but they are within the boundaries. Think about what he is being asked to give up, Aurora Dot, he is being asked to relinquish a woman who quite willingly accepted his mark, which binds them as a married couple by our laws, as I'm certain you recall. After all, I remember hearing about a similar situation with a young woman not 600 years ago. Lady Aurora Phoenix had the grace to blush straight to the roots of her bright blonde hair. Gerard Gremory. We agreed to never talk about that. The man laughed, acquiescence and gracious wind wrapped together. It wasn't often he won an argument like that, and he was going to savor it for as long as Venelana let him. Okay, Gerard. That's enough. Erk. Well, there went his fun. I believe that either way Yuzumaki-sama is entitled to a concession from all parties here, Lord Phoenix. Grafia said quietly, her words bringing a sense of foreboding. What do you mean, Lucifuge? Lord Phoenix demanded. Lord Yuzumaki is well within his rights to demand things from all three men in this room, as you are the ones who are challenging his right to Ria's sama Riser sama is merely using you all as a medium, for without your support this could not have come to pass. She explained, as such, he is rightly entitled to restitution from Lord Grimmery, Lord Phoenix, and Lord Lucifer. Serzich's blinked as his mind ran through the books of underworld law he had memorized. Though he'd admit he typically relied on Grafia for knowledge of the laws, he wasn't incompetent. His eyes widened a minute later. She's right, he breathed into the silence. Does that mean, Aurora started quietly, that he could get both Grafia and get his territory back? Stunned expressions were the men's only response. Yes, yes he could, Gerard said slowly. Because of the fact that it was not Serzich's Grimmery who wronged him, but rather Mao Serzich's Lucifer. Which means he can still obtain Grafia, as she was the only forfeit given that would really affect Serzich's. Venelana asked, trying to confirm their thoughts. Yes, that is exactly what it means, Venelana Sama. As a matter of fact, no matter the outcome of the match, he is entitled to restitution from Serzich's Sama. Grafia stated quietly, before seemingly squaring her shoulders. I am willing to accept being given to Yuzumaki-sama. It is both my duty and the punishment levied against my king. He's also your husband, Aurora protested. Only in name, Aurora-sama, Grafia replied. Despite appearances, I am not fully bonded to Serzich's sama and I am not Milika's mother. Silence descended once more, followed shortly by an angry glare from Venelana for her son. Serzich's, what is she talking about? The man sighed and sagged heavily in his seat. Milika's is the child of a mistress of mine who died in childbirth. Grafia accepted the role of mother because she felt it was her duty. Does Milika's Chan know? Venelana demanded. Serzich's shook his head slightly, I was going to tell him when he got a bit older. Old enough to understand that he needed to know the love of a mother in the place of a fairly absent father. Oh, my son. His mother started, you well-meaning fool. Eyes snapped to her all around, you should have told him when he could understand that she was a surrogate and not his true mother. Now he's become attached and taking her away from him will hurt his little heart. He is only minimally attached, Venelana Sama, Grafia said, not quite defending Serzich's. I have kept a neutral stance at all times, never calling him my child and acting as I have seen human nannies do. If we can bring in a replacement, I doubt that he will mind over much. The brunette blinked, really. But I always see him napping on your chest with a smile, her lap, or bringing you things he thinks are interesting. That's how young boys are toward their mothers. Grafia nodded slightly, yes, he does do all those things. However, I hardly encourage them. I've made it known to him that I may not be around forever. So you think he's just trying to build up memories? Gerard asked, perhaps thinking that Uriel may die soon. The silver-haired woman nodded after a moment of thought. 
She had certainly never claimed the boy as her own, but she knew young children tended to be somewhat more perceptive than most would give them credit for. Yuzumaki Naruto at the age of four years was a perfect example. At that young age, he had not only known of his role in life and some reasons for it, but it accepted it and decided that he would enjoy what he could. Grafia was glad, though, that Milikas hadn't turned to pranks. Serzichas cleared his throat, gaining everyone's attention. So, considering Grafia is to be my contribution to the forfeiture terms, that leaves both of your families with two general options. I don't suppose you might have an answer on hand. The married couples shared expressions between themselves. Gerard grimaced, honestly, son, the Gremory are down an option. We were given the choices of returning the territory recruiting rights or allowing Yuzumaki to impregnate Grafia and let him claim the child as his own. With Grafia becoming your forfeiture, that really only leaves returning the territory. Serzichas hummed in thought and glanced at Grafia who nodded back. Well, I'm certain that Yuzumaki Dono isn't unreasonable. In light of the laws, I think if you could bring up another possible answer, he might accept it. Aurora spoke up just then, as that is a Gremory issue, I'll just go ahead and accept his terms of forfeiting Riser's peerage. It will take time to recruit new members, of course, but our daughter, Ravel, is part of it. I think that should be a perfectly fine compensation. It was Serzich's turn to grimace, unfortunately for young Riser, Ajuka has recently put into effect a new rule for the evil pieces. He refuses to give out new pieces to those who have lost them, for whatever reason. The surrender of his peerage will mean Riser giving up the commanding king piece within himself, which means Ajuka won't give him a new set. Aurora gasped, can he do that? Gerard cracked out a cynical laugh, are you going to tell him, one of the four Mayu, he can't. The blonde woman bowed her head. Her son would lose all rights to possessing a peerage if he lost. And for some reason, Aurora didn't believe Riser had the proverbial snowball's chance in hell. That is our choice, Lord Phoenix said solemnly. Should he lose, Riser will surrender his peerage to the Yuzumaki to do with as he pleases. Serzichas nodded, circled their choice, and got them to sign the message to make it official. Lord and Lady Phoenix then left the room, they had preparations to make. The door closed quietly behind them, sounding suspiciously like the final bell toll of the doomed. Then Alana watched her long-time friend leave, the blonde woman looking somehow haggard. Her eyes roved over to her husband of nearly a millennium, and instantly her hand smacked him in the back of the head. When he turned back to demand an answer, he found only the wrathful visage of an absolutely pissed woman waiting on his beloved wife's features. All of this, she practically hissed at him, because you were bored. He flinched in response, his gaze dropping to the floor. He couldn't deny it, he and the phoenix had agreed it was too easy and out, and had conspired to do something to relieve their boredom at the same time. He didn't even realize the implications and problems inherent in the plan, because he left most of the political maneuvers to Venelana. I have half a mind to offer myself as our end of the forfeit. She continued in a voice filled with venom. She bore his mark, yes, and willingly at that, but his foolishness had helped to cause a situation where a child would lose the first mother figure of its life. Venelana Gremory, formerly Venelana Bale, was feeling more than a little put out with her husband right at that moment. Gerard Gremory snapped wide eyes, filled with hurt, to his wife's gaze. His wife, his beloved mate, was almost willing to give herself to another man because of his mistake. The amount of pain in his gaze caused Benelana to drop the blatant look of hostility as she realized he finally knew the kind of pain he himself had caused with his actions. Yes she was angry, but she still loved the man despite of his faults. She sighed, rubbing the bridge of her nose. Okay, not quite that far, but it's a very near thing Gerard. Now, we need to determine an appropriate counter-offer. Lord Grimmery heaved a sigh of relief. Of course, dear. What would you suggest? We can hardly give him Grafia, as she is to be Serzich's forfeit now. What do we have that could be of equivalent value to Rhea's? Then Alana shot him a swift withering glare, nothing equals her, naturally, dear husband. He flinched again, another mistake of words on his part. But the rights of recruitment, now that we might be able to equal. Both Gerard and Serzich's frowned, neither able to follow her train of thought. What do you mean, mother? She smiled at him, I mean, my dense little boy, cue another wince, this one from Serzich's, that while your darling little sister is invaluable, the recruiting rights are not. Perhaps we can exchange the favor with Naruto-kun, allow him, his clan, and his peerage to recruit within our territory, this Japan that Riaz is so fascinated with, which he is currently unable to do. The two men blinked, looked at each other and blinked again, before they both slammed their heads on the desk. How did they not think of that? It was an obvious illusion, it practically stared them in the face, and they didn't see it. Then Alana smiled triumphantly, and with more than a hint of mirth and derision as well, before straightening her features into a bland mask and facing Grafia. I take it you are willing to deliver the counter-offer, Grafia-chan. The silver-haired maid bowed, of course ma'am. Shall I inform Naruto-sama of the phoenix's decision as well? If you would, dear. 
and Grafia Chan, Benalana said, catching the other woman's attention, thank you for all your years of service. I cannot tell you how much I appreciate it. It was my duty ma'am. Grafia turned and left, Benalana frowning as she watched her former daughter-in-law go. Oh, Grafia Chan, I hope that you can find more than just your duty with that young man. Break Naruto was once more relaxing with Kishina, this time in the office, with her in his lap as they took up one of the couches. Naruto knew he couldn't keep showering her with all of his attention, and this was to be the last day of such blatant favoritism. Kishina understood, thankfully, but had wanted to have fun in a relatively public location. Thus they were in the middle of removing each other's clothing when Grafia arrived from a circle. Thankfully the silver-haired woman had simply blinked and then ignored their state of undress, and the two Yuzumaki didn't even bother covering themselves. Grafia then proceeded to deliver her message, all the while the rampant pheromones of the two Yuzumaki were wreaking havoc on her desires. I will not fold because of some damned instinct. Grafia told herself, I will do my duty. Naruto stared at her when she finished, nipping lightly at the back of Kishina's neck so as to not lose the mood they had earlier. So you're saying that the Phoenix have agreed to give Riser's full peerage to me to do with as I wish, well you are actually Serzich's apology which I'll get to keep no matter the outcome of the match. And the Gremory want to try and give the Yuzumaki the same recruiting rights like they themselves received. Did I get that correct? Grafia shifted minutely, attempting to relieve a rather sizable arousal, that is correct, Naruto-sama. Damn him and his sexiness. Grafia's inner voice roared, her eyes unconsciously taking in Naruto's bare and sweaty chest. M.M., Kishina moaned lightly at Naruto's continued attack on her weak points, does that mean you have already been given to us, Grafia-chan? Shifting in her stance again, Grafia nodded once. That is also correct, Kishina-sama. A smirk befitting a devil found its way onto both Yuzumaki's faces. Rising as one, neither of them even seeming to take notice as their remaining clothing fell to the floor, Kishina moved around behind Grafia and pressed herself against the other woman's back. Meanwhile, Naruto reached up and lightly cupped Grafia's face between his hands. Are you certain about this, Grafia? Naruto asked softly, his eyes shining with barely restrained lust, once we take you, you will never want for another lover. It is both my duty and my responsibility, Naruto-sama, the woman replied, her eyes only just starting to glaze over from the power of the mixing pheromones. Grafia hissed slightly when Kishina nipped at her barely revealed neck, rubbing her thighs unconsciously, yes, Naruto-sama, I want this. Then you'll have it, Grafia-chan, he said warmly as both he and Kishina released their pheromones to full strength within the room. Naruto nipped lightly at Grafia's collarbone as Kishina undid the garment obscuring the silver-haired woman's body, over and over and over, until you can't think of anything you'd rather do. We'll break you of that cool attitude and free that heart of ice to love, Grafia Lucifuge. Y.E.S., Naruto-sama. Kishina-sama. All throughout the night, cries of ecstasy could be heard from the office, getting louder and more varied as more women joined in the fun. Break what do you mean if I lose I'll surrender my peerage to the Yuzumaki. This was the outraged scream of one riser phoenix, third son of the noble phoenix pillar family. He was a tall young man, with short blonde hair slicked back, dark blue eyes, the pale skin of one who did not get out into the light often, and was wearing a burgundy pantsuit. He was also practically frothing at the mouth after hearing the results of a last-minute meeting between his parents and Mao Lucifer. Lord Rizal Phoenix snapped. This is a punishment for trying to take a fellow devil's legally recognized bride. I warned you this could backfire. Ria's is mine. Riser growled, she was always meant to be mine. My contract was made prior to this other, spurious and obvious attempt to avoid her true fate. Slap. Riser stared up at the unrivaled fury of his mother, one hand to his red and suspiciously not healing cheek. Aurora Phoenix, originally Aurora Lucifuge, younger cousin of Grafia, stood radiating a fury like she never had before. Her eyes were burning with the coldest of ice blue, a temperature Riser was certain would freeze him for all eternity. No son of mine could be so arrogant. So self-righteous so wrongly raised. She ranted, her power flaring to heights riser hardly dared to hope of reaching, you will submit to the ruling of your lord father, myself, and lord Lucifer, or I will personally repudiate you from this family. Riser just gaped and nodded senselessly. His mother was willing to repudiate him. Willing to disown him so thoroughly that no other family would ever think of taking him in, no woman could be with him without being thought of as the most desperate of harlot. It was inconceivable. The story of his parents' romance was all but legendary in the underworld. The true romantics declared that the woman's frozen heart of ice had been melted and freed by Rizal's passion and love, and as far as Riser knew that was exactly what happened. His mother had once been Underworld's foremost ice magic specialist, even beating out her cousin Grafia and the current Leviathan, as she could actually freeze the Phoenix family's fire magic. Then something happened when she met his father, and they bonded like few devils ever experienced. Now Aurora Lucifuge lived her life as Aurora Phoenix and had supposedly not touched her ice magic since that day centuries before. 
Bryzer supposed part of the reason for her lack of using her power was the fact that none of her children had inherited the Lucifuge ice. However, now he had experienced what he thought was her full power, and even as just an aura, it was enough to scare him speechless. He'd probably need a change of pants, too. He gulped and silently wished he hadn't pushed so hard for all of this. It was the last thought Riser Phoenix had before his mother's fury hit him. Break Naruto and his peerage sat in an elaborate extra-dimensional recreation of the occult research club's not-so-little building. It had been decided that the rating game between himself and Riser would take place in a copy of Kuo Academy and its surrounding grounds, specifically the main new building, the old building where the orc made its home, and the sports grounds between. It wasn't ideal, but it was familiar territory. The two sides were each granted their own base, Naruto had the club room, while Riser had the student council room. Any of the pawns who made it into the building occupied by the opposition would be able to promote at that time, much like the game of shogi. It made little difference to Naruto, however. Naruto's peerage was strong, and Riser didn't know just how many pieces he actually had. It was one of the things the young Uzumaki was counting on. That in the overwhelming righteous female wrath that no few of his peerage seemed to emanate, from the unusually vicious-looking Yugao to the typically gentle and placid Hinata. The amount of feminine fury in the room with him was enough to make Naruto glad he wasn't in Riser's place right then. This won't be a match, it'll be a one-sided slaughter. Let the match between Naruto of House Yuzumaki and Riser of House Phoenix begin. That's it for today guys, hope you enjoy this video, if you do please leave a like share and subscribe for more, thanks for watching.